Welcome, everybody. Um, so the objectives of this session will be to uh, recognize contributing factors to stress in the community, identify strategies and techniques to help reduce that stress, and understanding how to provide emotional support to someone going through a stressful situation. So um, I don't know if you've all used Menti before. Um, if you could, with your computer or phone or other smart device, please go to the website at the top of the screen, www.menti.com, and use the code above um, and answer the poll um, that I've provided. What is stress? You know, it's always helpful to sort of gauge everyone's understanding of this before we get going. Um, you can, I think, I think I said it so that you can um, respond up to three times. Um, but I'll go ahead and give a few minutes to let everyone kind of respond and you'll see that you should see the responses um, start to pop up um, as people are answering. All right, inordinate worry or anxiety about the past, present or future, uh, tension, uh, Interesting. Someone said an evolutionary response. We will get to that. That is a good thought. A weight on my head. Also good. I see tension a lot. Anything that causes you to deviate from normal homeostasis. I hear a lot of medical jargon around here. Physiological arousal. You guys have quite the vocabulary. Acute or chronic worry or anxiety about something going on. Response to a threat. Adverse response to negative situations. We'll kind of go into that as well. Good, it can be good or bad. <laughs> this, this green bubble just kind of answered this purple bubble right here. All right, I'll give you maybe uh, 15 to 20 more seconds and then we'll go on to with the rest of the presentation. You stress and distress. Okay, I've seen that. That's actually a little bit of an outdated terminology, um, but I, I, that is something that they, uh, I think they still teach in undergraduate. Um, trigger of mental illness can be, it very much can be. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Wow, this quite a few responses. Good job, everyone. Um, with that in mind, what actually is stress? Um, again, it's normal. Everyone has stress, but it's actually a really vague term. It's caused by a change in your environment. Um, let it be said that humans don't take to change well, at least on a physiologic level, meaning your body does not respond well. Um, and it's not just all in your head. You know, it can activate several things in your body, starting from your brain and going all the way down. Um, I won't go too deep into it because it's not, it's not super pertinent to what you'll be doing as a mental health advocate, but it's important to kind of understand at least some of the background here. Um, a stressful response, whether that's physical or psychological, can trigger a hormone called cortisol um, coming from your brain. And once your brain recognizes something as stressful, uh, it has many effects sort of downstream in your body. I'm sure a lot of you have had the experience of having an upset stomach or like a chest pain, or you can't go to sleep because you just are stressed. There's an upcoming test. Um, there's a bill that's due. There's, you know, something that you're really worried about coming up like on the weekend. Um, of course, that's not to say you can't cause mental health issues. You know, stress is a very direct cause of anxiety. Um, and that's sort of a term you'll hear more as you go uh, into the world of mental health. Um, and that brings me to poll number two. Tell us, and this is another free response. Tell me about how you tell me about how you feel physically when you get stressed. Um, you know, I'm, you can respond up to three times again. Um, anxious, that's good. Yeah, physically, mentally, any of it. Increased heart rate, stomach ache, butterflies, tired, backache. That's interesting. Pain can be exacerbated by cortisol. That's true. Like no breath is ever a complete one. Yeah, that shortness of breath, it's a very common reaction. Frustrated, avoidant. All 
awesome. Great responses, guys. I'll give it another 10 seconds maybe, and then we will move on. Acid reflux, yes. If you have an underlying medical condition, it can definitely make it worse. Um, tension in shoulders, LOL bad. That is the best answer. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, alert. Oh, that's, a, that's actually really helpful. Um, there are positive and negative aspects of stress. Um, you, you, you can, um, in short bursts, um, be helped by stress because it makes you more alert, it tenses your muscles, and it makes you ready for action. That's actually a great uh, transition to my next slide. I believe someone talked about this in the first poll. Uh, stress is actually an evolutionary response. Um, classically, way back in caveman times, uh, stress and the cortisol pathway was a, a thing that was beneficial. It helped people survive because if they see that saber-toothed tiger or they see that danger, right, that rock falling towards them, they get stressed, they get anxious, and it activates this fight-or-flight response. There is a technical medical term for this called uh, the sympathetic nervous system. When you are stressed, it activates the sympathetic nervous system to take blood and focus away from your internal organs and towards your muscles and your lungs and your heart so that you can breathe fast and run fast or get ready to fight. Um, the opposite of that would be parasympathetic, meaning you're resting and digesting. You may have heard that phrase as well. Um, this is where you're, the threat is gone or you've just eaten. Um, and you can return to your normal activity, meaning the blood will go back to your internal organs, you can rest, you can sort of digest that food that you've eaten. And this sort of balance is, is what has made it helpful throughout the years, but more and more research has been coming out that chronically, if this stress system is activated more often than not, or if it's activated inappropriately, it can be bad for your health long term. And, there, and there, it's, a, it's quite a hot topic, especially when you talk about anxiety and stress and how it relates to your overall health and it, how it in, integrates into things like hypertension, um, high cholesterol, um, general heart health. Um, all of it can be negatively impacted. Um, but um, like someone was saying, someone's answer was it could be, could be good. Um, yeah, it could be good. And that's why it's evolved this way. So it's it's important not to view stress as totally bad. You can grow and learn from it. Um, but as we grew past the, the sort of caveman era, we began to think about stress in such a way that necessitated that we kind of organize it into sort of a structure. Um, I don't know if, you, if you've taken any kind of psychology class in, um, in college, maybe even high school, um, you probably have seen this chart. Um, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it was originally pioneered um, by um, Maslow in 1943. He wrote a sort of a paper, um, a sort of conceptualized how people are motivated to act. Um, and the, the theory behind it is that we can only function at a level consistent with our lowest possible um, lowest possible needs being met. So if you don't have, let's say in the safety needs section, if you don't have uh, security or safety, if you don't have a safe place to be, you can't worry about friendships. You can't worry about uh, meeting your self-esteem needs, right? You can't realize your full potential because you have to meet that security need first. And on top of that, if you don't have food, water, warmth, you have to get regress even further. So it only, it really compounds, right? If you're in a safe environment, if you have food, if you have some of those basic needs, you can then start to worry about sort of more sophisticated psychological needs. And you can imagine how some of these things, if they're missing, can contribute to stress in the community. Some of these things are more concrete, like at the bottom of the pyramid, but some of them are much less concrete but still are stressful. And you see a lot of mental health interplay in a lot of these in a lot of these levels, but you'll see relationship problems being a cause of mental health, um, a lack of a uh, sense of accomplishment or prestige at their job or at school. I can definitely contribute to stress. Um, and probably the most existential of it 
achieving one's full potential is something that's very, very meta, um, but can nonetheless contribute to stress. If you feel like you are, uh, you are not doing what you're supposed to be doing, or you are not achieving your full potential. I have a demonstration of the hierarchy of needs in action. Uh, okay, so I have, a, I have a YouTube video here. Um, it's just a bunch of people at a uh, Verizon store. Um, as you watch the video, just sort of, oh, it's an Apple store, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as you're watching the video, just sort of look at all these people, they're just attending to psychological or maybe even self-actualization needs. They're shopping for things, they're seeing what would make them happy in life. But at some point a gun is fired and I want you to see everyone's reaction. You'll be able to tell. Did you see the reaction? <laughs> there was a split second there where everyone reacted. They went from happily shopping at Apple to after this gun is fired, running for their life. You see that sympathetic nervous system get activated. That fight or flight response was really, really kicking into high gear. Um, and so they weren't worried about Apple anymore. Um, that poor lady nearly left her, her baby behind, um, which we can get into maybe later. But um, everyone was just trying to fend for themselves, get out of there as fast as possible. They very much regressed to probably this green level here, the safety needs, right? So they're not thinking about anything else anymore. They're only thinking about safety. Maybe an hour, two hours, or even a couple of days later, they'll return to these higher levels. But at that moment, they're only thinking about safety. All right, one more poll time. How does stress come about in your daily life? Write some ways in which either you've encountered stress or someone close to you has. School ever present, you're never done with school. <laughs> Financially, yes, exams, work, work, absolutely. Oh, made mistakes in lab, that is a bummer, I'm sorry. Medical school applications, I do remember that. That was stressful, I can identify with that for sure. Work, expectations, oh, this person, expectations, they are functioning at a very, very high, uh, psychological needs on Maslow's hierarchy there. Housework, COVID, oh, definitely, definitely coronavirus, the MCAT, big tests, big things that are deemed important, it sounds like are stressful. What I, what I didn't necessarily see though, and let me, I'll give you a few more seconds, but I didn't see some key things which I think We'll, ha we'll have to talk about. I've seen it indirectly talk about. I'll give, I'll give it maybe uh, 15 to 30 more seconds for some more responses. When I'm not overwhelmed, I'm not doing enough. Oh, I wonder if those are two separate or together. That sounds like a, you're overwhelmed and the response to being overwhelmed. Career stuff, procrastination, losing weight. All right, friend issues, family relationships. All right, this country, very vague, very vague, legal status, good, okay. Well, what I didn't see mentioned, and it kind of speaks to everyone's um, sort of functioning on this hierarchy, I said it indirectly mentioned, but food, the bottom of that pyramid, some people in this country still do not have secure access to food. And, and that's very stressful. Um, aside from all other health implications of not having enough food, as you can see on the right side of this left graph, 10.5% of households are food insecure, just overall in this entire country. That's a huge number. It's like 30 million Americans. Um, and you can see on the, on the right category that this um, the green line on the right graph is um, sort of the average. Um, and this is pulled from census data. This is publicly accessible data. The, the, the divide, it's, and you can see the contribution to that insecurity, right? Um, 
Latinx communities and Black communities have a much higher incidence of food insecurity. You can even break it up into geographic location. You can see in the South here, in general in the South, um, food insecurity is much more rampant. Now, this graph in particular is defined as very low food security, which means um, that someone in the household had to alter their food habits or was not eating enough as defined by um, you know, national health standards. Um, food insecurity is more of um, they don't have enough money or are worried that they don't have a secure next meal. So, and this, I just put this in because it's important to sort of the bottom line. Children are very important. And, and you can see on the far left in 2019, 13.6% of households with children were food insecure, um, but only 6.5% of children were food insecure themselves, meaning the adults would usually take the brunt of it. Um, but it still can be stressful for a child seeing your mother and father in that situation. We don't have enough time for this because um, I've uh, been told that it's, uh, I'm about up with my time, but um, this could be a great homework assignment. Uh, I, I heard that you did something similar last week. Um, we won't be putting you in breakout groups for this, but um, I, I looked through the, the US Census data and for a family of four, um, taking into account average um, rent and average expenses outside of food, um, a family of four at the poverty line, their weekly budget for food is about $125. Um, it might be a good and sort of poignant lesson to try and go on, and I've, I've listed some helpful websites maybe um, with bargain food places. It might be helpful to try and figure out, okay, what's my family budget for the week? How can I possibly get three meals a day for seven days for all four of my family members and make it reasonably healthy? Um, so something to think about. All right. Um, this is Jonathan taking over. Hello, y'all. Uh, so I say get your cell phones out. Really just have a window open. It, this is on Minty, so <laughs> you've, if you've been able to participate so far, you'll probably be able to continue to persi participate. Um, so uh, nice to meet you all. I'm Jonathan, also a first year psychiatry resident at Duke. So while Chris was talking about kind of like, uh, he, he, a lot of our, our topics kind of go together, but a lot of the biological things behind stress, I'm gonna be talking about kind of like at a community level stress. So, um, and I'll have to tell Chris when to switch slides. So let's go ahead and switch slides. Oh, this is the, um, this is the poll, yeah. Oh, shoot, well, there you go. You guys are, you guys are, able to like respond and do it before I even prompting you. So I'm glad you're all already thinking about this. This is kind of like, <laughs> this is kind of the premise. I, uh, tears, many tears, weight loss, weight gain, you guys got it. L let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so the first topic I'm gonna go through is adverse childhood experiences. Uh, my talk's gonna basically be three main topics, adverse childhood experiences, a little bit on health disparities, and then we're going to have a breakout group at the end to kind of discuss what, what can we do about that. And that kind of leads into our next topic. So adverse childhood experiences. Uh, the name kind of says it all. It's essentially adversity experiences in childhood. So this can be violence, abuse, family disruptions, things like that. Um, can you go ahead and switch slides for me? So adverse childhood experiences was first coins in 1998. There was a study that came out using data from 1995, 1996, with lots and lots of adults, you can see here, over 13,000 adults. Uh, this study was essentially looking at adverse childhood experience, the people that have adversity in childhood and what the effects are later in life. Not necessarily the most representative population. You can see that there's 83.9% are white, and then the adults are on the Kaiser Health Plan, which is a form of insurance. And as Chris was mentioning, if you are making less money, you are, Unfortunately, the data shows that you're probably gonna have worse health outcomes as well. So keep that in mind as we go through these next sections. Um, but essentially, yeah, these, these are questions are about childhood adversity. So I'm now putting the ball in y'all's court uh, to take a look at these questions. These are the questions from the study. There's 10 of them and they go over 10 different kinds of adversity that one could experience in childhood. 
I put a QR code there. You're welcome to use, but it's already on Minty, so you could just like. Yeah. Actually... So actually, I, I integrate it into this Minty presentation, so you should be able to use the same um, the same code and the same screen that you already have. Um, but I'm going to leave these questions up, and we can look at the results after I give, we give a few minutes. Oh, okay. Perfect. So I'm going to give you guys just a couple of minutes to look through here, like minute, minute and a half, something like that, and just keep track of your personal number of how many of these you said yes to. And then we'll kind of, and you don't have to do this. Uh, if you do choose to do this, this is anonymous, 100%. But we're going to see like our conglomerate, how many adverse childhood experiences that all of us have done, have had together. So uh, take, a, take a minute here, just kind of read through these. Okay, let's see. Hopefully everybody's had a good chance to like read these and note how many of yours is positive. So let's take a look at ours, like our conglomerate. Give this a few seconds to like finish. Okay, so Let's see, it's kind of creeping up. The, the one is kind of creeping up 48%. But gosh, a good percentage of us, like more than half of us have more than one. And I mean, even having one, that's a significant adverse event in one's life. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty significant amount here. We have some people that have as many as eight as well. This isn't really, I'm just trying to like demonstrate how common adversity is in childhood. Um, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So these kinds of questions, physical, emotional, all these of you, it's really common. Um, let's, I, I wanna tell you a little bit about how like the study participants in the, a, the original ACE trial also like what their results were. If we move on to the next slide. Okay, so definitely don't try to read all this, but I just wanted to circle a few things and point them out in particular. So take a look at this. In the study, the People, 23% uh, of them had people that used alcohol or a family member had alcohol use, 12.5, so one eighth of people had a mother that was treated violently. So like, unfortunately, this group, there's a lot of adversity. And on this group in particular, 52.1% had some at least one category reported. So that's definitely pretty significant. We can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so now I, I pose the question to you. Uh, I was originally going to do this in either chat or do we have a Minty poll on this? Uh, no, we do not. So okay. yeah, chat might be the, the option. Yeah, stick it in chat. So why are ACEs important? Why am I bringing this up? I'll give you guys like 30 seconds to a minute to go through this. Uh, yeah, so Talia, because they predict uh, health outcomes, you got it. That's, that's the whole purpose behind the study. They have a lasting impact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a, a header for one of these slides. Uh, time does not heal all wounds. And that's exactly what this study shows. Identification, prevention, predict future SES and health outcomes. Yeah, so this is, you're all a pretty well-informed crowd. Yeah, you got it. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So, and again, don't try to read all this. This is just kind of like, trying to highlight a few more things from the ACE study. These are the health risky behaviors. And there's a whole lot of tables in the ACE study. So I encourage you to look it up on your own if you have time, but just to kind of point out a few things, um, just looking at smoking alone, 
If you have four or more, then the prevalence of smoking, at four or more ACEs, the prevalence of smoking is 16.5%. Compared to if you have zero ACEs, then the prevalence was 6.8% in this study. And if you're able to read, the text is a little bit small, but you can see there's a dose response. So the more categories you have, one, two, three, four, the more that the prevalence of this study shows is you're gonna be smoking. Um, same thing with obesity. You could see like 5.4% of zero, 12% of the people that had four or more, ever attempted suicide, I think is one of the most like alarming parts of this. Uh, it's really fascinating. You can see the, the ones that I circled in the very bottom. So if you have zero uh, ACEs, then the prevalence in the study was at least that 1.2% of them had attempted suicide. And then if there were four or more, then 18.3% of the people had attempted suicide. That's a huge jump. So if you can see like on the very bottom right, that kind of right circle, I circle the odds ratio. So it just basically an odds ratio is saying, okay, so if you have zero ACEs, then the odds ratio is one. If you have four or more, then the odds ratio is 12.2. That's like over a thousand times or a thousand percent increase. That's like 10 times odds of you have had a, ever attempted suicide. If you look at the prevalence and the a number of categories. So this is really, really striking. So you can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So next, this is looking at not just the risks, but actually the outcomes of ACEs. So same kind of thing, dose response relationship, where you can see that if you have more ACEs, you're more likely to have heart disease, stroke, diabetes. So really it's like not just mental, it's physical, like you guys were alluding to when I asked this question in the chat. You can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So it's not hard to imagine what the mechanism is behind this. Um, there's probably a lot at play, but basically you could imagine somebody going through some kind of adversity, having a bad time at it, using maladaptive coping mechanisms, smoking, drinking, using substances in order to cope with the serious adversity that they've experienced for a good portion of their life. That leads to things like diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, leads to stroke, COPD, and very likely death. Uh, you can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So I thought this was particularly fascinating. There's tons of research coming out about ACEs. This study, like I said, it was published in 1998. So we've had like over 20 more years to just think about this and do all kinds of studies. Basically, I just kind of wanted to touch on a few things that were interesting to me. People that have ACEs have decreased telomere length. Uh, telomere is a thing, it's the ends of the DNA. And having decreased length is actually a sign of aging and cell toxicity as well. I, it's also fascinating, you can see, like I kind of just put in bullet points, transgenerational DNA changes. So there's been some studies that show that mothers that have experienced ACEs, they have more methylation on their DNA. Methylation is a way of silencing DNA. So if you have like, genes that are made in your body, genes make proteins, that's what makes your body run, the genes are actually shut down and stopped by this methylation. And the, actually people that have ACEs have more DNA methylation. And I thought this was interesting too, fetal placentas. So mothers that have ACEs, the fetal placentas of the babies that they give birth to will have decreased telomeres as well. Really, really fascinating, like the mechanism behind this and still a fascinating level, like area of research. You can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is just kind of like, again, summary slide here of ACEs. Adverse childhood experiences lead to cognitive impairment, social, emotional, risky behaviors, and then early death. Uh, keep in mind that this population in this study was not representative of the United States in general, certainly not the world. Uh, a very profoundly white population with at least a level of income to be able to have insurance. So this brings me to the next part of the talk here of health disparities. So health disparities is its own area of research. There's all kinds of things that can be talked about related to health disparities. Just to kind of show you what you're looking at here, this is a graph that shows, based on race, ethnicity, the people that are getting mental health care. So you can see if you're white, then the prevalence of getting mental health care is far larger than all those other races, ethnicities listed on there. This is just one example. If you're talking about health disparities, health disparities can be, is essentially just separating people by different populations. So you could do it race, ethnicity, language spoken. You could do it by like uh, socioeconomic status, income. You could do it by all kinds of things. And so people kind of develop their niches when they study health disparities. You can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So why do health disparities exist? So there's all kinds of reasons why. Uh, 
Oh, go back there just a moment. Oh, that to the yeah. <laughs> so all kinds of reasons why you could have health disparities. I imagine you guys could, uh, if you, why don't you go ahead and put some in the chat? Like, why do you think health disparities exist? There's a little cheat kind of slide that was coming on next. Um, I'm going to focus on just two reasons in this talk, but there's all sorts of reasons why health disparities might exist. Stigma is huge, mistrust, huge, huge, mistrust of physicians, access. You guys got it. Like, there's all kinds of barriers. Language barriers, huge. Yeah, yeah. Mistrust, institutionalized racism, takes time. You guys got it. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So this is, I think, uh, I just kind of wanted to mention this. Some of you might already be aware of this, but this is a really unfortunate part of medical history, medical research, um, just to illustrate why people maybe wouldn't want to come to the doctor. Uh, you, there's, a, there's a term used in health disparity literature, help-seeking behavior. So what makes somebody help-seeking, help like when they need it, if they have mental disorders or if they have physical problems, versus physician avoidance, not wanting to see the doctor? So this trial, this Tuskegee syphilis trial, uh, there's, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a long story. So just to kind of break it down to you, syphilis is a disease that is potentially deadly. And we have a cure for it. We've had a cure for a very long time. You can see in the, in the timeline in the corner, 1945 is when penicillin was accepted as the treatment of choice for syphilis. But there was this study that was done, uh, started before then, that wanted to see what were the effects on one's body if syphilis were not treated. And it has a terribly racist name, uh, but it's something along the lines of uh, untreated syphilis in the Negro population. And so just take a look at this timeline. This started in the 1940s, was continued. In the 1960s, people started thinking about, oh, maybe we shouldn't do this. The CDC in 1969 reaffirmed the study saying this is an important study and this continued on. And then 1972, first article started to come out about condemning, condemning the study. And then there, soon thereafter, not soon enough, the study actually ended. But this was like, this was over 30 years of a study going on, not treating people with the medical problem, a potentially deadly one. So you can imagine, unfortunately, why you know, black people would be resistant to come or at least listen to the doctor, given our unfortunate history. So you can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So this is, we're all kind of from different areas in this talk, but I thought I'd give you guys a little history lesson of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I'm from. So you can kind of see in this old looking map with the circle, this is Tulsa back in the 1920s. Uh, the Tulsa, interesting fact, used to be the richest city per capita in the United States. In the 1920s and 30s, the depression didn't even touch us. Like it was, we barely even noticed it because we had so much oil money. Um, thing I wanted to mention is a really, really sad part of Tulsa history. Um, you can just kind of showing the circle here and uh, just below that is downtown and the circle is a part of Tulsa back then called Black Wall Street, which there's various Black Wall Streets, but this is the one of Tulsa where a lot of wealthy black people lived. And there was unfortunately a, a very, it's kind of a long story, but it culminated in Black Wall Street being burnt to the ground by a mob of angry people, completely burnt to the ground multiple people killed. News stories to this day, we don't know how many people were killed because it wasn't reported on at the time and there were conflicting reports. Um, this is actually one of the largest race riots in the entire United States history. Uh, so you could imagine why it, this is, a, a, if somebody experienced this, let's say like you were a child and you saw your neighborhood burnt to the ground and people killed. You would grow up and you would install values in your children. And you may not even intentionally do it, but you would likely install a value of not trusting white people or not trusting people in a position of power because there was nobody helping these people. So you move on in life and you have kids and then your kids have kids and your kids may not even know that there was a race riot, but there was, it, yeah, it was absolutely a massacre. Um, the kids may not even know that it's a race riot, but they still have these values, this kind of mistrust that's just built into like their culture and a mistrust of people that are in a position of power. And for better or worse, doctors are thought of as being in a position of power. And so there's this like, cultural mistrust that's been built in for this and all kinds of examples like this that have occurred in American history, unfortunately. But we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So... 
talking a little bit more about Tulsa, take a look at the le left thing here on the screen at first. So I thought this was interesting. If you take a look, this is a map of modern day Tulsa, like actually about 10 years ago. But uh, the unfortunate truth is the black people live in the north and the rich white people live in the south. And you can see there's a huge disparity on life expectancy, as low as 70 years in the north and 81 in the south. So University of Oklahoma, where I went to medical school, knew about this. We actually were the ones who like, were making note of this. And then uh, in an effort to change this, University of Oklahoma created a clinic in North Tulsa in order to improve access and try to make this number change. So take a look on the right part of the paper now, or the slide. The Oklahoma Eagle is the newspaper for North Tulsa. And the, the title, I love this, is, Tol is North Tulsa being pimped by OU? So the perception was, OU was not coming to help anybody. OU was coming to make money off of this population in the north part of Tulsa. Uh, I, I actually know the, the president of OU at the time. He gave a few lectures in our medical school. He's an amazing guy. Uh, I do not, I believe his intentions were purely out of trying to improve access. Um, but you can see this like generational mistrust that's come. Like even when people are offering help and trying to help, there's this like pulling back because of this societal like mistrust that's just been built into your DNA, unfortunately. Uh, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So what else is there? Uh, that's uh, this next part. I was going to show you a little bit, uh, a little video. In the interest of time, I'm going to hold off on that just because we don't have too much time. The, the idea is, so there is physician avoidance, but we can't, of course, blame everything on the patients who are just not coming to see us as doctors. Like, well, why, are they, why don't we, they don't want to help? Why don't we just, like, why don't they want help from us? Why can't we, uh, obviously, there are things that we have, and some of you guys mentioned things like structural racism. Um, there's this term implicit bias, which I, I don't remember if this was in the chat as well, but this is the, another part that I wanted to touch on related to health disparities. Um, if you have time, this video I think is a really cute video. It challenges, it kind of like the main character has some misperceptions of like it's an elderly white lady about like a black person that she ran into. And it's a cute little short film and challenged my perception, certainly. So if you have time later on, I definitely recommend you watch this. We can go ahead and skip past that for now. Okay, so yeah, skip past this one as well. So I want to at least draw like the distinction between what these two things are. So implicit bias is where you don't have a feeling like one race is superior to another. You just, for whatever reason, societal, cultural influences have a knee-jerk reaction to have bias and treat somebody differently, completely unconsciously. Like you, you're not doing this maliciously, this is just, it happens. Um, there's a really cool test that I, I believe was developed by Harvard and you could find this, uh, it's the implicit bias test if you just Google that online. And again, in the interest of time, I'm not having you do it now, but it's just a really cool thing to like, kind of show yourself like, well, do I have any bias that I'm just not aware of? And it's just a really neat way of examining that. Uh, there's actually been some workshops developed for implicit bias, and there's some studies that show that actually physicians that have had implicit biases before, like they've had different outcomes for patients that have different colors or gender, or whatever it is. If they have this workshop, the differences in outcomes actually go away. So this implicit bias thing actually is, is really neat. Um, drawing the distinction between that and racism, though, is very important because people can feel a stigma against this. Like it's, it can be hard to admit for some people that they have these biases, even though like the object is like, well, you don't really think that people are better than you or you're better than them. Um, so if racism is more like, yeah, I do think I'm better than you, or I think that this race is different than this race. And if you are racist, then these workshops are definitely not for you um, because you, of, of course, you have to be able to make note of the biases that you have and be willing to change them rather than having like misperceptions of feeling that one race is better than the other. We can go ahead and move on from there. So now this is the breakout room section. So we're going to take about 10 minutes or so, and then um, we'll come back and share for like three more minutes. Um, I'll go ahead and open up breakout rooms. The thing that I'm going to have you guys discuss is what can be done. And this kind of feeds into the next part of the workshop as well. What can you do right now? Like not in 10 years, not in five years, not once you have your degree, but like right now in order to prevent or reduce 
adverse childhood experiences and or health disparities. So I'll go ahead and break you guys up now into groups of Let's do four or five, and then I'll have you guys assign a speaker. And we won't have time for everybody to talk, unfortunately, but I'd love to hear what some people have come up with. So go ahead and take like 10 minutes. Yeah, OK. So uh, if anybody wants to go first, uh, just kind of like, it just I don't think there's any better way of doing this. Just kind of start, and we'll figure it out later. We'll just take a few minutes here. What do you come up with? to be our brave volunteer who can verbally tell us. Hi. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, whoever. Oh, okay. I was just going to say um, for both of ours, we were for both um, situations, we were saying bringing awareness and just using our background as potential scientists or doctors, using our backgrounds to kind of serve as translators for others so that they Kind of breaking down science in a more pamphlet like readout form format so just kind of providing information to them in ways that they can digest and understand i love it i love it there's a term breaking abridging the gap that had been thrown around a lot when i was in med school and that's that's right on the money is like how, how do we how do we communicate all of this um to a level that's like easy to understand and facilitates like this back and forth communication who else for sure one thing that was brought up in, in our group, um, and it, it seems tangentially related at first, so I'll so bear with me. Um, but there was some research that was done using animal models, um, specifically rhesus monkeys, where they were raised without their mothers, kind of modeling this adverse childhood experience. And we found that these monkeys were at an increased rate of anxiety and alcohol intake, but that this risk for alcohol intake could be mitigated if they were raised or um, reared in, in social groups. Um, and specifically social groups where their peers were mother raised. Um, and so this bringing it back to adverse childhood experiences, I think is a, a potentially good model to say that individuals who do have these um, experiences or people who experience health disparities need support. They need people who can help them, who can um, be an advocate. And so in some ways being a lay mental health advocate might be helpful in that term. You got it, man. That's that's incredible. First off, I had no idea you monkeys would turn to alcohol, but <laughs> that's a fascinating uh, part right there. But yeah, exactly. Like that really comes back to the point of these workshops, right? It's like, what can we do to help people despite the adversity they've gone through? Anybody else? I think uh, one thing we covered uh, as far as adverse uh, childhood experiences was um, early childhood mentoring. And this can be, you know, a way to, so kids talk a lot. Kids will tell you literally their whole life. I'm, I'm telling you. Um, so I think and it'd probably be a little more difficult now uh, as far as COVID, but, you know, prior to COVID or even after um, we see a mitigation of the spread. I'm getting involved in as far as uh, like elementary schools and uh, after school programs in which we're able to talk to kids and allow them to, you know, enable some trust in us. And, you know, maybe they'll, release some information that may be pivotal towards their, um, I guess, overall health. And, you know, we can relay this information back to somebody who can actually help them as far as being an, an advocate for children, um, as far as uh, health disparities. Um, one thing we touched on was acknowledgement, acknowledging that these disparities exist within this community. And, you know, acknowledgement goes a long way. Um, and just providing people um, and supplying different organizations that provide basic living necessities like shelters and food um, and simple things such as water in which everybody doesn't have access to clean drinking water. Um, these are some of the things that we can do um, right now to kind of alleviate these things in communities. Wonderful, wonderful. I love your focus on right now and everything you mentioned, like just simply engaging the community. It goes a long way. And and there's so many ways to go about that. So thank you. I think maybe we have time for one more short one if we can. Hey, let's see, I'm gonna start video up. Okay, so one thing we kind of talked about is educating ourselves. And I think obviously this lay mental health program is one way to do that. I don't know if you've heard of the term like the blind leading the blind, but obviously that never goes well. So just kind of acknowledging within ourselves um, ways that we might've even had ACEs um, in our past and our histories 
and how that's impacted us so that we can come from a position of grace to um, understand other people's frustrations and outbursts and especially as physicians, but even just in the community with friends and family um, and give people that room to, to talk about it um, if we educate ourselves and, and have more um, understanding for what they are. I love it. Yeah, exactly. Like having those conversations, modeling how to have those conversations and participating in things to build your ability to have those conversations. So thank you so much. I, I wish we had time to hear from everybody, but I wanna make sure to leave some time uh, now. It's the one hour mark. So uh, we'll take the next five minutes for questions if you want, or feel free to just go on break, go to the bathroom, whatever you need, and you can reconvene with us and, at 8.05 or five minutes. It's 8.05 here in five minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please let us know. In the meantime, you can just like shout out. Has, has there been any um, literature that has talked about how exposing someone to like understanding how ACEs affects their life has like maybe had an impact on the effects of ACEs? Like, is there been study on how, what, what can we, like what are interventions to prevent like the adverse outcomes despite ACEs? Right, or right. Or like the fact that like this happened in your life, it affects sort of how you become like now, like for example, like attachment styles. And if you grew up in an abusive household, you're probably gonna have a pretty like avoidant or anxious attachment style. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you become an adult, you sort of look for that kind of love, even though it's painful because it's familiar. Um, but then once you become aware of those things like attachment styles and how you look for it because of how you were raised younger, like it mm -hmm. makes you aware and therefore less likely to be a victim of some of the... Yeah, absolutely. So what you're touching on is something that is a level, it's a current research is going into that um, along the line of like, how, what can we do to intervene? What can we say like, oh, if somebody has an ACE, like maybe they were abused in childhood, does that make them more likely to be in a problem relationship now where they're being physically abused themselves? And the, the literature is very much like, how can, can we use these ACEs as screening instruments? In a primary care clinic, for example, like you come to see your doctor, you fill out a form that says your ACEs and the doctor knows to pay more attention to questions like, do you feel safe at home? And things like that. So yeah, good question. Yeah, I feel like that's a balance between awareness in a productive way and rumination and kind of dwelling on it. No, I feel like if it's in a guided way um, that focuses on healing and um, kind of closure with that past, I feel like that's a healthy way to talk about it and be aware of it, but I think that's a balance. Yeah, I mean, what you're touching on, we in psychiatry certainly are no stranger to um, people that have trauma. A lot of times coming to terms with that trauma in, in various ways can be very therapeutic for them. I wanted to ask, um, does your training, your psychiatry training, does it address how, what to do about ACEs um, or like how, how to process that with your patients? Yeah, so I think it does in various ways. And Chris and Brian, feel free to chime in if you have any more thoughts on this. But in psychiatry, um, well, in medicine in general, there's like a structured interview that we go through. And a part of that is the social history. And in psychiatry, we tend to delve into things like traumas, abuse, things like that. And that informs like diagnostically what kinds of things we give our patients, like PTSD, for example. Um, but also it can be very helpful in therapy for people to revisit these if they're ready in a very, uh, like we call it trauma-focused way um, to be kind of like gently ease people into these conversations. And um, people that do have trauma-focused therapy for um, 
PTSD, for example, do have reduced symptoms afterwards and can like get to a point where they don't have yeah, such un discomfort because of it. Yeah, I would agree with all that. Um, I think obviously like, if when we're dealing with children, trying to screen as best we can in order to prevent more occurrences, getting people into treatment early. I think that by the time that people are adults, we're always treating the individual that's in front of us. But it's very helpful to have this conceptualization of how their trauma has influenced them throughout their life and led them to the person that they are now. And then very much like trauma-based therapy, which is very different than like cognitive behavioral therapy or like other forms of therapy. I think the information about like the shorter like telomeres and difference in like embryos is really interesting because it has me just thinking about like what are those effects long term, especially like right now when this country literally has kids in cages and are traumatizing whole families with deportations. Like what are the long term effects of all of those things, um, let alone something like slavery, right? Um, so does it's that like does that necessarily mean like people who have those shortened telomeres will live less less long or like is that the is that the theory as far as i'm aware that it is a it's associated with aging having decreased telomeres uh, I, I don't know if there's like a causation necessarily there may be something out there um but that's certainly implied given what we know about telomeres um if you guys chris and brian happen to know more than that please chime in um, otherwise, I think we should move on to our next session. And Chris, you go ahead and go ahead and start up. All right. Sorry, everyone, for my camera going away. That is some weird uh, side effect of uh, whatever platform I'm using Zoom with. So the second part of this presentation is going to switch from being less background and informational to being more um, skills focused. So what, what can you as an advocate do if you notice that someone is in a mental health crisis? Um, uh, I'm sure you've heard the term triage. If you watch Grey's Anatomy or some other medical show, you've probably heard the word triage. Basically, it means that you have to assess the situation and very quickly stabilize whatever is happening. So in the event that you've noticed that someone is doing poorly, the first thing that you do is you evaluate it, just like you would in a 911 sort of cardiac arrest situation. Look around, is the scene safe? Is the scene safe for you? Is the scene safe for the other person? Um, you can approach it generally, sort of, hey, you know, what's going on? Tell me what's on your mind. Leave it open-ended. Um, they may not respond. They, they may respond and they might wanna talk about it. Um, but if you notice that things are escalating, very important things to ask in a crisis. There are three specific questions that you should always ask. Do you want to hurt yourself? Um, you know, cutting or suicide, and you can word that bluntly, you can word that gently. Um, the important thing is to get that information. Do you wanna hurt other people? Sometimes in mental health crises, you can get homicidal ideation rather than suicidal ideation. And are you now seeing or hearing things that isn't quite so normal for them? If, if the person is diagnosed with schizophrenia, they may not answer positively to this question, but you can tell if they are sort of looking around or conversing with someone who isn't there. And, and sort of this part of the presentation is more geared towards very, very acute situations. So if someone is acutely suicidal right in the moment, this is what you do. So taking a break, uh, I'm sure this is not a situation that all of you have been in before. So talking about in making the environment safe, what would you say is the most common drug that's used in overdoses? And you can, you can respond up to three times, um, but it's free response. Uh, so please log up back on to Menti. It's prescriptions, naloxone, alcohol, opioids. So naloxone is actually a very helpful in treating overdoses. If you overdose on opioids, naloxone is the treatment. Um, it, is, it acts the opposite way that other opioids do, like heroin, on those receptors. So it can actually save someone's life. Uh, alcohol, 
over I saw over the counter drugs. That's an interesting thought. Cleaning supplies, ketamine. These are all really good. Um, but I'm gonna switch to the next slide. And these are all things that I would have thought too. But the answer might surprise some of you. Tylenol. Tylenol is uh, by far the most common drug used in overdoses. And it's, I mean, if you're if you're someone trying to make the environment safe, it's not something that you would think of. Hide the Tylenol. But if someone is very, very acutely determined to end their life, Tylenol is something that we all have in our house. And, and now that you're aware of it, I'm hopeful that you might be able to do something in the future. So as I kind of allude, been alluding to for the last few slides, safety is sort of the most important thing when you're sort of triaging mental health. If you're unsure, again, like experience really helps a lot, but if you're unsure at any time, call 911. Don't hesitate to bring them to medical attention. Don't feel like you have to take all the responsibility yourself. It's better to do something than to feel overwhelmed and not have that person get the help that they need. If you're, especially if you're scared for your own safety. Um, you know, I, having come off of night shift on the ED, I, I've seen so many patients taken in by the police because the family did the right thing and were scared for themselves or their loved ones and said, okay, we need you to take, come to the emergency room, get evaluated. So this is a skill that Brian is also gonna talk on when he does his segment. Um, but this is actually a thing that we do in the hospital. Um, if someone has come in and they are suicidal or, um, or even if they just had the thought of wanting to end their life, this is a, a good way to help conceptualize, okay, how do you recognize these kind of negative thoughts or crises and what do you do about it? So uh, this could, I don't think we have time for sort of a breakout sort of group situation, but this might be a good thing to sort of work on um, in the interim. You can find a patient safety plan template by Googling suicide safety plan template. Um, and you can find one of these, fill out one for yourself. Uh, it might be helpful um, and, and sort of getting, um, uh, sort of a feel for it. And if you are advocating for someone in particular and they've been through the mental health care system, there's a pretty high likelihood that they will have one of these in their house or ha will have filled out one before. But it's helpful for you to know as advocates, what are the steps? So they go from the most external um, and, the, and the least sort of scary to sort of the most aggressive and the most internal, right? First thing, first step is recognizing it, all right? Um, I'm sure you've all seen someone sort of be anxious or stressed out, um, but a patient, they're patient specific. So things like racing heart or suicidal thoughts can be all be warning signs. Um, even if it's just a mood or a behavior that they do, if they like to pace, if they like to tap their foot, these are all signs. Um, the next step would be, can they calm themselves without anyone's help? And sometimes they can. And some of the skills that we'll be teaching you later in the, in the, uh, in the session will kind of address this step. And you can help remind um, people that you are advocating for about some of these steps. Uh, but step three is the first step where you involve outside help, right? Um, so you're talking to someone, you don't have to say anything about what's going on internally, but it's a helpful distraction. Pre-COVID times, you would be able to go to a place, it's not as, common of a coping strategy anymore, but hopefully in the future, it, it can be revitalized. Um, step four being, uh, who do you talk to? Um, I'm not sure what you'll be doing as an advocate. You might be able to put yourself on this step um, if you have a really good relationship with somebody, but typically the people that go here are, are family members or really, really close friends. Um, someone that you can talk to about those dark thoughts or about what's going on with you. And again, number five and number six, if, if things are way past your comfort zone, you can always seek medical attention. Um, the key thing is safety, safety, safety. Um, if you notice things like uh, guns, um, any kind of medicines, even Tylenol, uh, sharp implements, those are all things to sort of think about to help make environments safe. Taking away car keys, some people you know, try and get into accidents, um, all things to think about. 
And I wanted to put a few resources. Um, some of you may have heard these, some of you might not have. Um, you know, there's a National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, you know, you can always call 911. There's no where urgent cares are or emergency rooms are so that you can help take people there or direct um, police. And the Trevor Project is actually really, really, um, it's an amazing resource, especially for the LGBTQ community. Um, I've had patients that have used this hotline um, um, instead of the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, so these are just some things to know you might find in um, throughout your life that there are other resources that work better, but these are some that I've seen. All right, so that was sort of an acute, very, very um, sort of um, mental health crises sort of triage, uh, but things aren't always going to be that acute um, and things aren't always going to be that scary. I'm going to pass it on to Brian here um, and he can tell you about emotional support. Yeah, hey everyone. So again, I'm Brian. I'm one of the second year psychiatry residents at Duke. Um, so Chris and Jonathan have talked about stress and what it can look like in the community and the things that it can have. Um, I'm going to take some time to talk about some skills that we can utilize with our patients, um, either when things are more acute or kind of in the long term. Um, and then at some point, we'll have a little breakout session to try and practice these skills. Uh, but if you guys have any questions, please feel free to throw it into the chat and I'll try to answer them as best I can. So just a brief overview of the topics that we're going to go through. The first one are techniques to be more present with patients. Um, I utilize this a lot. I teach it to all the medical students that I work with. Um, and it seems like a lot of you guys are applying to medical school. And I think a great buy-in for that is uh, when you guys are doing the MMIs and then you have that station where you have a patient who's like in acute distress, this would be like a great place for you to like utilize those skills. <laughs> and of course, you know, with the patients that you're working with. Um, so on top of kind of being present with them, we'll talk about some specific techniques that we can do to try to help kind of relax ourselves, um, talking again about planning ahead, and then talking a little bit about a lot of the things that we probably do, but giving them a name to help recognize kind of the importance of it. And then kind of more long term, what can we do to help to reduce stress? And then how does that all kind of apply to us? So first off, uh, just starting off, um, hoping to do a word cloud here. So when your friends or your family members are coming to you, what are the things that you typically do? So I see a lot of listen, comfort, empathize, internalize. Actively listen. Yeah. Listen, listen, ask questions. Offer suggestions unconditionally. Cry, hug. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> so first off, I do I do want to say that, um, kind of adding to what was going on before. I, I do wanna say I'm super impressed um, by your guys' knowledge. It seems like you guys really know the terminology. <laughs> I feel like a lot of these terms I didn't encounter until I was a resident even. So kudos to you guys. So yeah, I think that a very common theme that I'm kind of seeing from this is listening, lending an ear, trying to be present and empathize with them, trying to help comfort them, and then trying to work towards solutions. That's kind of me trying to summarize this. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are some of the, the techniques that I often use. Um, first off, I'd like to look at this graph on the upper right-hand side. Um, this is something that was done back in 1999. That was a study to try to look at, for patients who actually respond to therapy, what are the predictors for those who actually respond? If you see in the green, uh, let, actually, let's start with uh, the blue side. So 40% of it, is actually the patient themselves. So who are they? What do they bring to the table? And then if you look at the green, which is 15%, is like, do they expect a benefit from therapy? And then another 15% is actually 
the technique that's being used. So what type of therapy are you actually using? And then another big chunk is 30%, which is simply, do you have a good relationship with the provider that you're working with? So with your therapist. The reason why I like to bring this up is that it's actually super surprising to me um, that 15% of the model that you're actually using, it's only 15% versus 30% is like, do you even have a good relationship with your patient? Um, so kind of keep that in mind, um, kind of how important that really is. And then these are some techniques that we can use to try to help establish that. Um, I think that there are two, um, two very general ways that are great to start. So one is using like a very soft and concerned voice or another one just being like genuine. Um, and that's something that I think that would be a great position as like lay mental health advocates, because as a doctor, sometimes you can't really utilize um, really just being like a normal person, right? So using a genuine tone, we're like, yeah, like that's frustrating. Like, dude, that effing sucks, right? Like that's much more appropriate as a friend, but not as a provider. Uh, so those are like two approaches that we can use. I think that the most common approach that I see when people are experiencing or like hearing difficulty is always saying like, I'm sorry, you know, like that really sucks. I think that that's a great place to start. I would say that trying to take it one step further, um, there's other terms that we can use to really help the other person who's talking to us, let them know that, you know, we hear them, right? So saying like, yeah, like I understand, like that really sucks. Or, you know, like I really wish that that wasn't happening to you. Or I can imagine that, you know, if you're going through all this, like you must be feeling really bad. Or I can't even imagine what that would feel like. like what does that feel like? Right. I think that those are some great terms to kind of add um, and will help engage. Uh, the next thing I like to talk about, and this is the one that we're actually going to try to practice, it's actually called uh, six forms of validation. What it is, it's like built into tiers. So one being the easiest, six being the hardest. And then knowing that during an encounter, most of the time we're kind of moving between them all. And not every time with every patient are we going to be able to encounter the highest tier, which would be six. So the first one is simply being present with someone. So for example, if you have someone who comes to work every day and they're just complaining every day and you're just like tired and you like can't even give them your attention, then you wouldn't be hitting one versus if you're like actively just there, giving someone your attention, making eye contact, you know, giving nonverbal cues, you know, shaking your head, things like that. That's probably tier one. The next step up is called accurately reflecting. So when someone's giving you this entire story of how the past year has been really tough for them ever since they lost their job and then they didn't have any money and now they've lost their housing and now like their girlfriend broke up with them. And so saying like, dang, it sounds like you just had a really tough year, right? That's kind of the next tier because it shows that you're actively listening you're able to like summarize it. And that's one way to show them that you're like, yeah, I'm listening to you, right? I would think, I would say that the next step up after that would be trying to actually name the emotion or thought that they're having and then checking for accuracy to see if you're actually right. And it's okay if you're not, because they'll tell you, right? So if someone is saying, um, you know, when, whenever I'm uh, taking exams, like, I just like can't focus and it's just like so hard, right? And you're saying like, wow, like it really sounds like what you're going through is like you're feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, and it seems like you're really just kind of building it up in your head. And that's one way to kind of take it one step up because you're one, helping them to identify the emotion that they're having. And sometimes they're not even able to get to that step. You can also do it with kind of a, a thought that they're having. So if they're coming to you and talking about, you know, like, did I make the right career decision? You know, talk about all the things that they're contemplating about why or it was or wasn't the right decision. And you can say, it sounds like you're starting to think about whether or not you need to make a career change, right? That's kind of the next step. Um, number four would be validating based on their history. So this is when you kind of know someone a little bit better. And so let's say that you're working with someone who has like a very long history of abusive relationships. And they're telling you how like, I'm in this new relationship. I just can't find myself like feeling comfortable with this person. 
and I can't find myself like opening up, right? And she was saying, you know, based on the history that you've had with like these difficult relationships, it makes a lot of sense that you're not able to open up with this person. That would be validating. Uh, next up would be normalizing. So this would be to the current circumstances. So, you know, if someone's telling you about how they've been having a tough time because their parent passed away, you know, saying like, you know, I think that makes sense. I think that anyone who lost their parent would be feeling down. And the last one, and kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, is radical genuineness. And so that's just talking to anyone as you would like a normal human being. So like laughing with them, crying with them, cursing, calling it as it is. And that really takes a, another level of empathy and human connection. And oftentimes that's really hard, right? I think especially if you're, you don't always agree. Um, but I think that that's like a great tier to kind of work towards. And I think especially as like, Play, like lay mental health advocates, it'd be a great position for you guys. Um, kind of putting that together, um, I think a very simple way to kind of get started with utilizing these skills is like telling them to tell you more, you know, echoing what they're telling you and then normalizing it, validating those emotions. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, spend about 15 minutes in this next group uh, break out into groups of three people and then taking turns. So having one person picking a topic that's been on their mind, trying to pick a topic that isn't too deep and like not too political ideally. And then just talking about how you've been feeling about it. And then have the second person listening, trying to utilize these skills and then trying to apply these skills by asking as few questions as you can. And then I'd like for the third person to just observe and kind of see how it goes and then switching. So we're going to do it for three rounds. So maybe uh, four minutes for each round and then maybe spending about three minutes kind of at the end for you guys to just talk and see how it went. And then uh, we'll come back, check in and see how that went. Yeah, makes sense. Clear as mud. <laughs> and then uh, I'm going to see. We'll make sure to text in what the instructions are too. Sorry for waiting when I did my breakout rooms. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think, you know, knowing that it's going to be hard, really, this is just a practice, take a run at it, and then kind of seeing how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, someone's asking to go back one slide. I also uh, pasted it into the chat, but my numbers aren't showing. They're coming at those question marks. Okay. Are they already in the breakout rooms? No, I'm putting them in the rooms now. Oh, uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave the six strategies up until they go into breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. Brian, I don't know if you wanted to uh, talk about this before we move on. Yeah, I, I would love to hear some feedback in terms of how that went. You brave souls. Can we just unmute and? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, so you talked about like the techniques for helping uh, a friend or someone you know, uh, you know, step by step, and you explain it really well. Uh, so, however, like I, I really like love to help others, but sometimes I notice that people they don't seek help; they just Sometimes they want to play like the victim card, you know, or just like always complaining. And when you give them a solution, they don't want to take it. So how do I deal with these people without being rude or disrespectful, like in a really nice, respectful way? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that when you guys have more of the other lectures, um, at least of 
when I look at the topics, I think that that'll also kind of play in um, because part of it is kind of understanding where people are coming from. Um, I think that a big part of that approach is having to meet people where they are, right? So like this question is something that we encounter often with patients. Um, you know, often people who have like substance use disorders, this is very similar. Um, a quote that or like, you know, something I always say is that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. I think that at the very minimum, what we can do is at least being present with people so that they can at least feel supported. I think that oftentimes the difference is when you're feeling alone, things can feel really unbearable. And that's when people get pushed towards like really severe mental illness or like suicidality and things like that versus simply feeling supported. If you have someone there for you, can like really have a very big difference. And I think that in terms of if it's really getting to that point that you're kind of describing where you're not able to like make a change and things aren't getting better, then really it's about trying to advocate them to like get mental health. And if they're not willing to do that, then you know, continuously just being there, continuing to gauge where they are. And then when they're finally at that step, then helping them to take that step. And that can take time, right? Yeah, 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 it takes time. But some, sometimes like I feel um, when I'm trying to help like the uh, others, they only come to me with their problems and they just want to complain. And that sometimes mm -hmm. me a little bit. So mm -hmm. I ask this question. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's a, a great point. And you can ask them that, right? Is that when someone's coming to you, you can say like, do you want me to just like listen here um, and let you vent? Or do you want to like, you know, think more about what can we actually do to work at that solution? Um, so it really depends, right? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Would I just be able to jump in and just uh, share how that went or are we stressed on time? Uh, I think we have time, go ahead. Okay, cool. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing those techniques because I feel like they really enhanced the, my listening abilities and also my, like it helped to have a template and how to respond because I spoke with uh, Nicole and Brendan, two postbacks here, and um, we essentially shared about some difficulties that we've been having as postbacks. And um, although we've never met, well, not in person at least, um, it was it was great to have those those like listening techniques and responsive responding techniques so that we can so that I could accurately like well just effectively kind of you know risk like like I guess commiserate with them and um I thought it was a great experience because it turns out that we we're all kind of going through the same thing and um yeah it was just it was just really awesome and I just want to thank you for having that activity yeah cool thank you for sharing <laughs> I'm glad that it was helpful for you guys um, I would also love to hear about some of the difficulties that you guys had in trying to use these skills trying to get the other perspective Uh, me or someone else? Anyone. <laughs> yeah, someone, someone can share if they would like to. I think just keeping it up and keeping everything in mind that you have to do is difficult. Keeping, you know, it's easy to do it for maybe one or two exchanges, but then as things start to pile up and you have to keep more information stored, it becomes, it can become difficult pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think like, you know, I wanted to ask this and also kind of talk about it. Um, these aren't easy things to really apply. I think that in terms of the learning process, it's like first understanding what it is, having practice with it, and then eventually by doing it often enough, it becomes more natural. And you won't be so much like thinking about doing it and then doing it, it just becomes this like next step, right? Um, but I, I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that like these are very challenging skills to do, but really it's like through repetition and through practice, it becomes natural. Cool, thanks you guys. I appreciate you guys sharing. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is when you yourself are feeling overwhelmed, what kind of things are you guys doing to try to help kind of ease that off? Yeah. 
Yeah, exercise, nice. <laughs> See meditation. <laughs> Duke highlights versus UNC. I love it. Read, sleep, distraction, binge, dance, work it out. Call a friend. Mm, kind of turn off for a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> These are all great responses. Anime, I love it. <laughs> we were just talking about that earlier. Okay, cool. So um, I think that this is also really important to think about so that when you're working with someone, these are ways that you can help them to in that moment, help kind of bring it down a little bit. Um, I think that at the very basic, something that's always great because it's at the bottom. So we're thinking like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, just hitting that basic, you know, the, the very bottom. So offering them food, a snack, a water or a drink, you know, offering like, are you warm enough? Like, do you need a blanket? Is a great way to like one, establish um, like a therapeutic alliance with the person in front of you. And then kind of getting back to what we we're talking about before, when someone's very, um, you know, fight or flight, their sympathetic response is like really high up there. You know, when you're feeding someone and you're keeping them warm, you're actually activating their parasympathetic response and you're helping them to kind of rest and digest. I think that that's a great place to start. Um, redirection is another skill that we often use. So when people are really upset that their TV is not working, and you're saying like, okay, like how about we go and do this, right? That's like one great way to do it. Um, a lot of people were talking about distraction in the last one, music, you know, watching TV, going for a walk, uh, reaching out to acquaintances, so friends and family. Um, and then some basic skills. Um, I think that, you know, taking deep breaths very quickly act uh, activates the parasympathetic response. So taking like, you know, three seconds to take a deep breath in, and then three seconds to take a deep breath out. And so I'll do this with people when they're a little bit more upset. And I'll say like, you know, okay, like I can tell that you're upset right now. I really want to talk to you about this, but it's hard for me to talk to you when things are so heated like this. You know, do you want to take some deep breaths with me? And then just taking a couple of deep breaths often can help people. Uh, and I think that I do want to highlight that some people won't respond as well to this, uh, but I think that doing it with them, with doing it with someone will help so it doesn't feel as condescending. And then kind of keeping in mind that triage that we're talking about before, that if you have someone who's like really agitated, who's like cursing and not just cursing in general, but cursing at you, or is really directing a lot of anger at you, you know, these things probably, um, if the acuity is just too high to try to find these things, um, just keep that in mind as well. Um, a couple other things that I wanted to talk about that I think are really helpful for a lot of patients, um, this is one of my favorites is like naming objects. So just looking around the room and saying, can you name five things around the room that are the color black? And then moving on and doing it, you know, can you name four things in the room that are the color white? And then three things in the room that are color blue, two yellow, one red. And it can really help to ground someone to kind of just bring them back and recenter themselves. Another technique is called intense exercise. And so this isn't, you know, like going for a run for like 30 minutes. Um, this is more when you're feeling really stressed out, doing as many push-ups as you can in the span of 30 seconds, or doing as many jumping jacks as you can in 30 seconds. And that like intense jolt can also help to kind of bring people down a bit as well. Um, I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, we won't um, practice them. Uh, but I think that these are kind of great things to just keep in mind to try to help someone in that threatening moment. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is probably a lot of things that we're doing just as humans, but often giving them giving a name. Um, this falls under supportive psychotherapy, so this is like the basics of talk therapy. Um, so the first we kind of talked about, you know, reflective listening and trying to get someone to say like, yeah, that's exactly what I mean, right? Um, another great skill is like organizing the narrative is what it's called. So when someone's, you know, feeling real distressed and talking about a lot of things, giving this really long story, 
and you're kind of telling it back to them in this really organized fashion, you're helping their thoughts to be more organized, and that can be very helpful for people. Uh, the next one's called lending one's ego. And so that's where you're using, you know, you who you know, may be more educated, who is like an external person in the situation, who's calmer, and then helping them to plan, make decisions, right? Another thing is trying to identify defenses that they've used in the past. So, you know, in the past, when you've gone through stressful things like this, what are things that have been helpful for you? And do you think that that would be helpful now? And this also kind of ties back to the skills we were just talking about, because if you can identify the skills that they've used, that can often be very helpful. The next one is restoring confidence. So oftentimes when people are going through a tough time, you know, it's tough, right? Um, so trying to recognize like, what are they doing well? Recognizing that fact, telling them that they're doing well, and then telling them to continue focusing on these strengths, right? Like you're so good at like naming your emotions and like letting people know you're having a tough time. Like, that's great, keep it up, you know? Um, and then advocating for them, you know, empowering them to advocate for themselves. Um, again, like, I think that these are great things to keep in mind and like know that when you're doing these things, like, it really is helpful. You know, there is data behind these things. Uh, and again, uh, so Chris had talked about this beforehand. Um, I think the only real thing that I wanted to add to this is that you know, before a big thing that we used to do with mental health was asking people like, you know, can you promise me that you're not gonna hurt yourself? You know, like contracting for safety. And that has been shown to like, not actually have a lot of data. I think that if they're not able to contract for safety, that's, you know, not a good sign. But this is kind of what has come to replace it. And so really thinking ahead and trying to plan ahead so that when we actually are kind of stressed out, it's so hard for us to like think logically through it and so having thought about it beforehand can be really helpful to people. Um, so really, I, I do think that this is helpful. Um, I think that if you have the time, you know, sitting down with, with patients and actually learning through it can be very helpful for organizing thoughts, planning ahead, making the environment safer, all those things. Okay, one more. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is a little bit different and emotional regulation, which is when you're like feeling really stressed out in the moment, how do you bring yourself back down to like a two or three? Um, this next question is like, what are things that you do to help increase your reserve? So, you know, like if you're having a bad day and it's raining and you're getting soaked, what makes the difference between you remaining, you know, kind of who you are and calm versus just like losing it, right? Um, it's something small into both, but I um, would love to see kind of what you guys do. Ice coffee. Get lit. <laughs> Yelling, music, yoga, tea. I see a lot of music. Taking deep breaths, gaming, dancing. Nice. <laughs> you know, I really agree with a lot of these things. Chocolate. TikTok. <laughs> Show gratitude. Ah, nice. Yeah, awesome. I definitely use a lot of these things too. Okay. Thanks for responding, guys. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to touch base on some of the things. Um, I think that you guys had already hit a lot of them. Um, these are kind of the things that I think about often, like for myself or with patients, um, and oftentimes kind of seeing where they are, thinking about these things, seeing what things like they might be interested in, and then trying to help them actually get there. So things that I've listed, uh, mindfulness, exercising consistently, religion and spirituality, you know, connecting with that community, um, tending to your hygiene, you know, are you drinking enough, are you eating healthy, are you eating enough, um, going out to nature, appreciating nature, going for walks, getting adequate sleep, you know, having your social connection, engaging with them, having your hobbies that you do, you know, showing gratitude to things, and then doing something that you enjoy every day. Uh, those are the things that, you know, come to mind for me. Um, if you're into mindfulness, there's you know, a bunch of apps. Those are things that I really recommend to patients a lot. 
Um, Aura and Headspace are like the ones that I use. Headspace is more, it takes you through a course and you're doing like different techniques every day. Or is more, uh, you give feedback on each session and it changes the new one it gives you each day. Uh, if you are interested in that, um, Aura, um, it, disclaimer is that uh, it's my friend, but I definitely like love the app and recommend it. If you want the premium, you can use this code, it's Duke Hospital, and then you'll get the premium. Uh, and so again, you know, I think that in terms of applying this to patients, the great place to start is asking them, you know, like, what are you doing to take care of yourself? You know, what are things that have been helpful for you in the past? Or saying like, hey, like, you know, these are things that have been helpful for me or for others. Like, do you mind if we like explore to see if any of these might be helpful for you? And then try to like talk them through, like, how do you actually like, do these things, right? Next slide, please. And then uh, kind of just wrapping things up, um, talking a little bit you know, about helping ourselves because recognizing that this is challenging work. It can often be very challenging. Um, people are going through difficult things. It's heavy work. You know, people can be really stressed out. And oftentimes, like, we're kind of on the receiving end of things. And I think that important things to know, recognize that oftentimes, like, you know, don't take things personally. Oftentimes, people are feeling, you know, really stressed, you know, really high activated and they're kind of just directing it at whoever's in front of them. I think the other thing is recognizing that oftentimes it can be frustrating work, right? And that's okay too. Um, you know, I think that like that emotion that you're feeling is valid. Of course, the important thing is recognizing like what are we doing about it, right? It's okay to feel kind of frustrated, but then if you're like yelling at someone, like that's not okay, right? And then of course like talking to people. Um, you know, this is like the big, uh, the big meme, right? With like therapists and psychiatrists, and, like crazy and have their own therapists, and psychiatrists. But I think a big part of it is that we also need to kind of unload and de-stress since this is often how we'll kind of accomplish that. And then I also really like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I kind of put it in here. Um, what I think about patients and then kind of conceptualizing what's going on with them. I often use this as a roadmap to see kind of what do they have? What are they missing? What can be improved upon? You know, it's kind of like tending to that, you know, mental garden that you have. And so like, even like for yourself, I think it's a great way to kind of think about like, you know, what am I missing? And I think that like, you know, we talk about like happiness. I think that when all these things are met, we're moving towards something that's like closer to like being content. And so just kind of summarizing very quickly the things we talked about. We talked about different skills for being present in the moment. Uh, we talked about when things are a little bit more heated in the moment, things that we can do to kind of help bring things down. We talked about the basics of talk therapy, things that we're often doing, just giving it a name. We talked about the suicide safety prevention plan and kind of thinking ahead of time and planning. Uh, we talked about reducing chronic stress and then kind of how that applies to us as well. And yeah, that wraps up my slides. Um, I think that's all we had. Um, I'm sorry, ran a couple minutes over, but if you guys have questions, you know, we're happy to answer them. Uh, is it possible for them to email the team and get back to us for questions? Okay, uh, if you have any questions for me, I'm going to take off now, but I wish you all a good night. Hey, Brian, I actually have one quick question. Yeah. What's up? What exactly I is mindfulness? Mm, good question. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> I, I was hoping to lead us through a mindfulness session, but we didn't have time for it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the definition of mindfulness is just being present in the current moment in a way that is non-judgmental. Uh, and that can be either internally or externally. Um, it actually stems from like Buddhism and meditation originally. And then since then, it's kind of been identified by a lot of like researchers and therapists. And then since then, there's been a lot of data that's come out on it. Um, it's been used in like so many different things like depression, schizophrenia, anxiety. Um, right now, it's like really hot for like burnout because like physician burnout is so big. And it's like one of the only things that has great data for. Um, I think that a lot of things can fall under mind, uh, mindfulness. So like if you're like listening to music and doing nothing but listening to music, like that's mindfulness. I got you. If you're doing all these things and the music just in the background is like very different, right? All right. Yeah. Uh, I think that like what it's actually doing, uh, there's like 
a lot of data out there, like looking at like Buddhist monks who have done it like 10 years, like their brains are actually different. Mm -hmm. And you can look under like imaging studies with like PET scans, MRIs, and see like what parts of the brain are lighting up. I think another way I think about it is like with like the neuroscience behind it, you know, your brain is like, you know, imagine like a walnut that started, it's like, a, you know, responsible for just like basic responses. Mm -hmm. And then you're slowly adding different layers on there that are different responsible things. And that's what your brain's doing all day is like coming up with all these different things. And so just being mindful can kind of help to like realign everything and kind of help to reset you to neutral. And okay. then if you're like able to do it like uh, long-term, there's a lot of like long-term benefits. Yeah, long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes sense. It makes sense. I guess it kind of like, I don't know, maybe putting in like just taking things like step by step or either like day by day, not trying to, uh, I guess, do too much at once. When you're thinking about mindfulness, just try to, I guess, just be in the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that by practicing mindfulness, let's say you do it like three minutes a day. Let's say you're just uh, focusing on how you're breathing or you're like eating a meal, you focus on every bite, like that kind of carries over throughout the rest of the day, if that makes okay. sense. Okay, it makes sense. There's a really good documentary on Netflix um, mm -hmm. uh, called Meditation. Um, it was made by the guy who created the Headspace, um, but it yeah. talks through like what mindfulness is, how your brain changes when you are practicing mindfulness and even shows you how to do some of the exercises really good documentary definitely check it out okay cool appreciate that and i uh, appreciate you all for for this session again you all have a good night yeah thanks for coming and participating <laughs> no problem no problem take care